Okay, picking up right where we left off, we've talked about passive transport, and you can see a summary there in the picture with the simple diffusion and the two types of facilitated diffusion through a channel and through a carrier, which changes shape. Now we're going to be looking at active transport. Most of active transport deals with transport pumps, which we call uniports or co-transporters. What you're seeing is one of the co-transporters there, the classic sodium-potassium pump, which we're going to talk more about in just a second. But first, I want to start off with the simplest, and that is the proton pump, which is just a very simple uniport. They're used all over the cell to move hydrogen ions against their gradient from low to high now, creating a positive space outside of the cell and a negative inside of the cell. And that's another common theme you're going to see with active transports is they will create a voltage gradient as well as a concentration gradient because they're moving ions. Here we've got a uniport, that same protein pump, using energy from ATP, creating a gradient where there is more hydrogen ion outside the cell than inside the cell, and it's using that energy to move sucrose into the cell because as the hydrogen flows down now its concentration gradient, that movement, very much like water moving through a hydroelectric dam and creating power, that movement carries sucrose along with it, transporting sucrose into the cell. So it's kind of an indirect or a secondary active transport. So that's one way that a simport or a co-transporter can be used. In this case, a simport. We're moving them in the same direction. This is the classic example of an antiport. So it's another co-transporter, but now we're moving things in opposite directions. We're still moving them against their concentration gradient. So you can see where sodium is low and where sodium is high. We're going to be moving sodium towards where it's already highly concentrated, creating an even steeper gradient. This is going to be using ATP energy yet again. So here we go. That protein is made to fit three sodium ions. When they are bound, that signals phosphorylation, meaning ATP adds a phosphate to the protein itself, becoming ADP, and now that is a phosphorylated protein. When that protein is phosphorylated, it changes its shape to empty the sodium outside the cell, so it changes its conformation. What that does is create a shape of the protein that is likely to pick up... Oh, and note the phosphorus is still there, the phosphate group. But this changes this protein shape to fit potassium. And so as that potassium comes in, its binding releases the phosphate group. So it is now an inorganic phosphate floating around in the cytoplasm. It can be picked up by an ADP to become an ATP. So we've released three sodium ions. Now we're picking up two potassium ions. So we're expelling more positive outside the cell than we're bringing into the cell. So that's going to, again, add to that positive charge outside the cell and a negative charge into the cell. So potassium is now bound, which again changes the shape, that plus the release of the phosphate group, brings that back closer to its original conformation, and then once it releases the potassium, it is fully back to its original conformation, so you can see those little sites don't fit the potassium anymore, and then this cycle can repeat over and over and over. 3 sodium out when ATP is added, 2 potassium in, releasing the inorganic phosphate, and then it can repeat over and over and over again, being phosphorylated, consuming some energy, releasing the sodium, taking in the 2 potassium, releasing the inorganic phosphate. 
again and again and again. And there are many, many of these in your cells. This is a very common potassium pump, and you'll see it in a nerve cell in just a second. That antiport, the sodium-potassium pump, can also be used to bring in glucose, sodium-glucose transport. So you can see the excess sodium there, so we've built up a concentration gradient of sodium, and now again it can bring in another sugar. So often your food, your sugar sources, especially those small monomers, those are coming in through this like secondary active transport where energy was used to get the sodium out and now the energy, the potential energy stored in those sodiums is what's bringing the glucose through. So it's still active transport. And there's that phosphorylation signaling that it used energy. Glucose is coming in. And that brings us to endo and exocytosis, sometimes considered a form of active transport, sometimes kind of left in a category all their own. But these things do what their name implies, in endo for in, cyto for cell. So we've got endocytosis moving materials in, exocytosis moving materials out, Endocytosis, anytime you pull things into the cell, you're consuming some of the membrane, so you're going to decrease the size of the membrane. But on the flip side, anytime you expel things from the cell, you're going to increase the size of the membrane because some of those membranes in those vesicles will, well, all of them will stay a part of the cell membrane until they are brought in again through endocytosis. Both of these use vesicles. And so this is part of that dynamic cell membrane I was talking about where it can change size, where bringing things in is decreasing the size and taking things out is incre increasing the size. There are a few types of endocytosis, or actually, let's talk about what exocytosis does because there is only one term for exocytosis. So exocytosis helps secrete enzymes Sometimes those enzymes are hormones. It could also secrete hormones. It could secrete the cell wall, so carbohydrates that it's adding, especially to the primary and secondary cell wall, especially the secondary. And it can dump undigested materials, like those secondary lysosomes that have all the undigested bits of cell left in them. It can ex Spell that waste, and so this is a good way for the cell to get rid of waste. And then in endocytosis, you've got three types, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, and receptor-mediated endocytosis. Phagocytosis engulfs food or large molecules, and then often after it has engulfed those molecules, we don't call that a vesicle, we'll call it a food vacuole but I see both terms being tossed around. Penocytosis engulfs liquid or ions or liquid and ions because it's just taking a little bit of that extracellular fluid in in a tiny little vesicle. And so we call phagocytosis also cell eating and penocytosis refers to cell drinking. Receptor-mediated endocytosis uses receptors. That is why it is mediated by the receptors. And those proteins are extremely specific. So endocytosis, phagocytosis, and pinocytosis, those types of endocytosis are nonspecific, whereas receptor-mediated endocytosis is very specific. So it's a good way to bring in rare substances that are large. So here you just can see a f some of these electron micrographs of these things happening and also uh, an illustration of them. So you can see phagocytosis extending those pseudopods, bringing in the food as it encloses that vesicle. Penocytosis is much more a dip 
that forms in the membrane and then it just pinches closed or seals closed forming a little vesicle. And then receptor mediated endocytosis is a little bit more complicated but not too bad. There are many protein receptors on the surface of your cells. The coat proteins, it's called a coated pit because it forms a dip like a pit, and the coat proteins help to hold those receptors in place, and they respond to changes in the receptor shape when it binds the specific ligands that it is searching for. And so once those receptors are bound to their specific ligands, they bring that coated vesicle in and then all of those parts can be disassembled and recycled back to the surface of the cell so that it can start all over again, bringing in very rare, very specific substances with receptor-mediated endocytosis. So here we go, putting it all together. Nerve cells use a lot of these processes that we've just talked about. So looking at nerve cells with their long arms, their axons, and their bodies, if you zoom in to a connection between one of the branches and the body of another nerve cell, you can see that exocytosis of neurotransmitters is happening. And that is signaled by calcium, but I didn't show that step. I'll, I'm starting with exocytosis. And the purple here is a gated channel. And so when it receives those neurotransmitters, it opens up allowing positive ions because you have this huge membrane potential where there's a lot of positive on the outside, very little positive on the inside or overall negative on the inside. And so positive rushes through the channel protein. What does this do? Well, it's going to be able to send a message because along those long skinny axons, and we'll just make some space for that. So imagine this is a zoomed in view of a part of the long skinny piece of the nerve cell. When the nerve cell is resting, this is what its membrane potential looks like. Again, negative on the inside, positive on the outside. So when the positive ions rest in, it flips the membrane potential. It becomes temporarily negative on the outside and positive on the inside. Well, that is a signal for other voltage-gated ion channels like we talked about before. They respond to the now positive and open up, allowing more positive to come in, which signals the next set of gates to open, allowing more positive to come in. Meanwhile, back at the beginning, sodium-potassium pumps are working like crazy, working, 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 to pump the sodium back out. And so that restores the membrane potential. And so on and so on this goes with Voltage-gated ion channels opening up, allowing the positive in. Sodium-potassium pumps pumping the positive back out and restoring that membrane potential all the way to the end where further signaling would signal the release of more neurotransmitters that would then set off this cascade again. It is much faster to pass the signals through these quick voltage electrochemical pathways than it is if those neurotransmitters had to flow or diffuse through more gaps. And so that is why nerve cells are very long and skinny because as fa even though the response to neurotransmitters happens extremely fast, it is not as fast as it can pass that message down the axons. So really, really amazing, uses lots of the processes we've talked about, and that is why cellular membrane transport, or transport through the plasma membrane, is such a cool, important process in our bodies.